All right, we're ready now. We'll start with our uh, speaker, uh, second speaker for the morning, who's been here several times before, spoken on his book called The God Hypothesis, Hypothesis, which I can't get out. And uh, a sequel to it is in the works, you'll be glad to know. Uh, he's spoken on the Mexican UFO activity, which we've all heard about. He's spoken on the uh, many legends of the serpent people, the Nagas, and so forth. And today he's going to go just a little bit further with um, a lecture on UFOs and shamanism. Uh, what shamans all over the world have experienced and how it relates to UFO contact and abductee reports. Uh, Joe was also one of the first ones, I guess we have to give him credit for this, he was one of the first writers to publicize the Lone Star Bar. So, you know, that deserves something. Uh, so please welcome back from El Paso, Texas, Joe Lewis. wander in uh, to see the UFO kooks and um, uh, just as I did in 1993 when Linda Moulton Howe dared me to attend a UFO conference and uh, I uh, being very macho decided uh, well I would take her up on that dare and I flew into Eureka Springs uh, for into Fayetteville uh, I work, uh, I'll give you a little bit of my background. Uh, I spent uh, 10 years uh, teaching at the university level, uh, journalism and mass communication. Um, I have a PhD in journalism from the University of Missouri. Missouri. Uh, and um, I uh, uh, wrote a book. Uh, I am Mexican American, born on the Mexican border first Mexican-American PhD in journalism in the United States. And I um, thank you. Not, I'm not running for public office. Uh, uh, that, that's already a good show on TV. Uh, and uh, wrote a book, uh, which was my dissertation called uh, Uses of the Media by the Chicano Movement. Not the Chicago Movement, but uh, Chicano is a word for Mexican-American and uh, was published by Prager Publishing Company in 1973. And uh, on the basis of, uh, of that book and um, my PhD, I uh, was offered the chairmanship of the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Texas at El Paso back in 1972, uh, where I worked uh, for 10 years until I got fed up with campus politics and decided uh, if I was going to be under that much stress, I would rather make some money. So <laughs> I uh, decided to leave uh, the academic world and um, become a financial advisor, which I had been doing for the past 23 years, and, um, and then doing this on the side. So I, I lead a double life because um, uh, what I do in my research does not mix well with what I do for a living. Uh, so I have to lead a very low profile uh, where I live um, and uh, speak in obscure places, <laughs> no offense, and um, avoid uh, uh, national media attention. Uh, this became a big problem when uh, my book, The God Hypothesis, uh, came out in um, uh, early April of 1997 uh, because uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my book but uh, it, it uh, that book got its genesis here at this conference in 1993 uh, was my first UFO conference and uh, I was a little bit uh, nervous about attending I didn't even know what a UFO conference was at that time and I sat in the back, and, and I was just going to audit, okay? If, you go, if, you know, if you've been to college, you know you can audit a class, and you don't have to raise your hand or anything or get a grade at the end. You just audit, you know, and you just sit there and listen. And that was my objective, was to come and sit and listen and, and to uh, 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 not get involved. 
I wasn't going to get involved. <laughs> that was in 1993. Well, 30-some UFO conferences later, I find myself back here again for maybe the fifth or sixth time. I can't remember. And, um, and I'm um, still in it. Um, I um, went through quite a panic when my book, The God Hypothesis, was published in early 97 because just before the book uh, was to come out, my publisher, Brian Chrissy, was urging me to finish it. He says, you've got to, we've got to get this out on the, on the shelves. Uh, this is a hot topic, UFO and religion. Well, the, to the book is about UFOs, religion, and science. But uh, we just had this strong feeling that the, the topic of uh, religion and UFOs was going to be a hot topic, that it was time to talk about it, and that you know maybe the Pope was going to make a statement about UFOs or... or uh, uh, there was going to be, uh, you know, Billy Graham, who, uh, who who has talked about UFOs in his books, actually, uh, was going to make some statement. We just felt it, it was really a hot item, and we ought to get to press quickly. So the book comes out in um, was due to come out in in the first weeks of April of '97, um, and uh, in late March of that year, I was at home and I uh, sat in front of the TV and I turned on the TV set and there was Dan Rather on the CBS Evening News talking about UFOs and religion. And I was just stunned. I mean, I just stood there with my mouth wide open and he was telling all about how a group of UFO cultists had killed themselves in a mass suicide in Rancho Santa Fe, California, uh, because they believed that their souls would be going to meet a spaceship that was following the Hale Bopp comet, and that they would be greeted there and they would be given alien bodies that they believed that their bodies were just vehicles or containers and that uh, the soul was the real person and that they were, they were going to be greeted uh, by um, these aliens aboard this spaceship. And uh, their leader, Marshall Applewhite, uh, had even told his followers that he indeed was an alien who had incarnated into human form uh, to lead them. Uh, on this path and I immediately ran to the bathroom and threw up and I after that I got on the phone and I called my publisher and I said Brian you have to stop the presses I am not going to get caught up in this this I could see was going to become a feeding frenzy it was, there was no room for rational discussion of UFOs or any of that stuff. And what's more, my book was all about uh, findings of reincarnation, uh, people who uh, believed that they were uh, not from this earth but were seated here from uh, alien uh, civilizations uh, that... Uh, uh, cases in which uh, uh, my subjects found them, uh, one of my subjects found herself uh, taken out of her body and uh, given a new body, uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, there was everything in my book they could have used to support their case for what they did, and I was mortified. I was scared to death. And I told my publisher, I said, okay. And I, when I said, stop the press, uh, he said, we can't stop the presses. It's already printed and it's shipped to the books. It's already being shipped to the bookstore. And I said, uh, well, I, I'm not going to get caught up in this. So, you know, no publicity for a while. Well, uh, I don't know how it happened, but 
uh, shortly after that, my phone started ringing off the hook. 48 hours, producer from 48 hours program, producer from 2020 program, producers from the Learning Channel, from the Discovery Channel, from magazines, from newspapers, all wanting interviews. And um, they were stunned when I told them I don't do interviews. <laughs> Wait a minute. You have a book. It's just come out. And you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you, you got it. And, um, and they couldn't understand. Well, would it help if I got Dan Rather to call you? No, I'm sorry. That's not going to help. Uh, in fact, I don't even want to talk to him. And, um, and so my publisher was mortified. I mean, I mean, here was the opportunity of a lifetime to, you know, just really uh, get all this publicity uh, for my book. And uh, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Um, it would, uh, first thing, there wasn't any, uh, this was not a time to rationally discuss UFOs and religion. Uh, there was no rationality. It was absolute uh, yellow journalism at its worst. Uh, and, I, and in one of the articles that came out uh, about this, it's just bone chilling because what they uh, reporters had gone into the house where the Heaven's Gate cult uh, had committed mass suicide, and they took down a list of every book that they had in the house, and they published this. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I am so glad this happened before my book was published <laughs> because if my book was on that list. I, I'd be dead meat, you know. I, I, I would be accused of, of causing this have to happen. Oh, I, I really would have felt bad because I thought, you know, I thought these guys, these poor people were nuts. And I thought they were very misguided. And I felt so sorry for them and their families. Um, and I didn't believe that there was a UFO trailing Hale Bopp. And, and, uh, and I didn't believe that... Uh, you know, if you commit suicide, you can direct where your soul goes. Uh, although, for all I know, they're still on that ship someplace in alien bodies, but that, that's not what I believed. Um, so uh, I went through a, a, a time there of uh, great stress because uh, of all that, and I didn't, um, I didn't want uh, any of that to rub off on my secret life as a mild-mannered financial advisor. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So, you know, back home, I'm just a, a financial advisor, and only a few people know that I do this. And here's where I really can talk to uh, people about what's deep down in my heart. Um, in 1993, when I came here as an observer, uh, I was uh, a bit of a, um, let's say, intellectual snob. I, I uh, fully expected that, uh, you know, I would be uh, mostly among people with uh, wearing beanies with propellers on their hats, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, and that uh, I, I didn't know what to expect. I I was just trying to lay low. And, and I, I'll tell you another, I'm going to get way off track here, but it is a funny story. I, when I, that time when I came here for the first time, I had just gotten off work, and I wear a, a business suit, a uh, dark business suit uh, and red tie, you know, power tie for, uh, for doing business. Uh, and I, I dashed out of work uh, at noon. I didn't tell anybody where I was going, and I got... Uh, on the plane, and I uh, landed at Fayetteville, and uh, there was a guy standing in, uh, out there with a little sign that said UFO Conference, and I kind of wandered over, <laughs> wandered over near, and I says, I'm with you, and, uh, you know, we, uh, we got into the, the shuttle, and we, we started coming up the windy roads uh, past all the chicken farms, and that smells so good, and, and, uh, 
and it was beautiful country, and there were three other guys in the car with me. And um, I, was try, I was trying to strike up a conversation because here are people that you can talk to about UFOs. And, and back home, I had nobody that I could talk to about UFOs. And, uh, and these guys just were, wouldn't talk. They were all clammed up. And so about halfway up here, it took that back then, it took almost two hours, it seemed. Uh, one of them turned to me and he said, um, are you with the Bureau? <laughs> And, and uh, you know, I, my, my, I, mean, I was totally naive about all this at this time. And I, 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 because of all the farmland, I, I said, you mean the Farm Bureau? <laughs> <laughs> and I was dead serious. And, and he says, no, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I said... No, I'm not with the Farm Bureau. I mean, with any bureau. I, I'm a financial advisor, and I just got off work. Ah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we believe that. So, uh, you know, we rode up in silence uh, for the rest of the trip, and uh, it turned out that the guy that asked me that was Antonio Hunea, so, uh, who, I, who I later... Uh, befriended and finally convinced I was not a uh, secret agent, but I knew, now I know, I always show up in jeans or shorts or something now. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, uh, what happened to me at that conference besides getting to meet Linda Howe and, and uh, a researcher and journalist that I really respect uh, and uh, so many interesting people uh, uh, at the Lone Star Bar, uh, most <laughs> Um, I um, uh, was absolutely blown away, blown, it just altered my reality when I heard uh, one of the speakers that weekend, someone I had never heard of, and let me see if this thing is going to work, there, um, 1993, um, not many people had heard of this man. Dr. John E. Mack, Harvard University, uh, professor of psychiatry, uh, practicing uh, uh, psychiatry for all those years, 40 years, um, really a giant in his field, a, re a reputable scientist who had published in um, you know, almost every scientific journal in his field. Um, he was uh, really um, a giant uh, in the science field and, and someone who was um, truly a scientist who would follow the data, follow his data wherever it took him. Um, and already uh, was deeply involved in uh, researching alien abductions. I didn't know this. I, I'd never heard of him. I uh, didn't. Not, most people hadn't heard of him in 1993. He hadn't written about it. He hadn't written his first book, um, uh, abductions. Uh, he was an unknown to me. And um, he was also a Pulitzer Prize winner for his uh, psychological profile of Lawrence of Arabia. So uh, a person with impeccable academic credentials. And he got up here on this podium and started talking. He didn't use any notes like me. He just started talking. And he was talking about the hundred or so people that he had examined who had had alien abduction experiences, and then he said the words that blew me away. He said, well, you know, so far I haven't found any signs of mental disorder among them. In fact, uh, there are, um, in general, pretty intelligent, highly functional uh, people, highly credible, uh, and uh, um, I have to say that uh, I believe that there is something real behind uh, their stories, that I cannot detect any signs of, um, of hoaxing or of um, uh, any kind of a mental problem. 
and uh, and there and then he said the words that uh, I thought uh, were incredible. He said, uh, "The problem is not that these people are crazy. The problem is that psychiatry uh, has no uh, pigeonhole to put them in. That." Psychiatry needs to change, and that science needs to change. That what we need is a new science with a new paradigm that will allow us to study these kinds of amazing personal experiences and other uh, phenomena uh, instead of just rejecting them out of hand. And when I heard him say that, I thought two things. The first thing I thought was, this is the most courageous scientist I have ever heard of. To stand in a UFO conference with the cameras rolling and a man with so much to lose to say these things, I thought was absolutely courageous. It was like a lightning bolt that just went right through me. And the second thought I had was, this guy's in for a heap of trouble. A heap of trouble. Because I had spent 10 years teaching at the university level on committees and uh, all kinds of merit committees and tenure committees. And, and uh, believe me, I knew what the academic world was like. And I knew that this was going to cause him problems because you do not challenge the scientific community like that. Uh, you do not challenge uh, your university and, and your field of study. You, if you want to maintain your credibility and your job and your grants and all that goes with being an academician, uh, you do not step out of the box. I know that. And I know now that one of the reasons I had to get out of the academic world was because as long as I was in the academic world, I was limited to do research and writing about my specialty. I couldn't go out and do this kind of research. It didn't have anything to do with my, uh, with my job description. So the only way that I could do this kind of work was to get out of academics and do it as a private citizen. And it gave me the freedom uh, to do that, but, it, but I had to do it on the sly. You know, it, I had t there was a, a trade-off there. So John and I got to be pretty good friends in the years after that. It wasn't long after that that I uh, started speaking myself, and uh, I ended up meeting John again in... Um, a couple of years later, when we were both speaking in um, Australia, this is one of my favorite photos of uh, John and myself. We're standing next to a, a giant, uh, I think it's a eucalyptus tree, I don't know, some kind of giant tree in the rainforest. Um, and we're soaking up the energy of this tree. And uh, it was during that trip that I showed John my manuscript for the God Hypothesis, and he... Uh, agreed to take it and, and read it, and he ended up liking it very much, and he endorsed it. Um, and the, I, I treasure the endorsement that's on the back cover of, uh, of my book uh, that John wrote. And um, I think that what John liked about my book was that I was able, because I was not in his position of being uh, a reputable scientist, I had more leeway and I was able to uh, say things that even he couldn't say. Um, and I was able to tackle the issue of UFOs and religion, which uh, some, most scientists would not want to deal with. Um, and, um, and he uh, liked that. He, he, he uh, enjoyed that part of it. Um, <clears throat> Later, uh, after the Ozark Conference, after my book came out, uh, then uh, he asked me to travel with him to Mexico 
and we spent uh, a week uh, traveling around Mexico. I speak Spanish, so uh, I was uh, able to help translate. We went to visit Jaime Maussan in uh, Mexico City. We traveled uh, to Tepoztlan to visit Carlos Diaz. Um, we interviewed numerous uh, people who, in Mexico who had had uh, the UFO contact experience and abduction experiences and, and, and contactees. Um, so we really had a chance to uh, bond uh, uh, at, during that time. And then when he wrote his second book, Passport to the Cosmos, he sent me his manuscript and asked me to make comments and suggestions, and, uh, and I did. So, and I'm very proud to be acknowledged in, in that book. Um, during that trip to Australia, that's uh, not Indiana Jones there with that hat on. <laughs> uh, we had the opportunity to meet with uh, some Aborigines and uh, a, an Aboriginal shaman. And this is the Aboriginal shaman who uh, drives a station wagon and has a television antenna on this house. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like the people that come to uh, New Mexico and Texas to see the Indian reservation. You know, they want to see American Indians, and uh, they come from the, around the world, and they expect to see them riding around on horses with, you know, the paint on their face, and, you know, and they find them living in houses with televisions and... Uh, running gambling casinos, and it's, it's a little bit uh, uh, disappointing. But, um, but it, it was, it, what was interesting about this uh, visit with this shaman uh, was uh, that the we had this long discussion with him about uh, UFOs. And, and he uh, spoke very good English and was very... Uh, um, uh, eloquent and to speak in his uh, way of speaking. Uh, he explained to us uh, very patiently that UFOs and uh, what we call alien beings are something that they have known about for thousands and thousands of years, that this is not um, something new to them, that, uh, that their shamans uh, commune with these beings uh, in what they call their dream time. And their dream time is uh, uh, when they go into altered states. And during these altered states, they have uh, out-of-body travel and out-of-body contact with beings. And they commune with them. And they learn from them. And they bring back that knowledge that they use to help themselves survive in the use of plants and being stewards to the earth and you know how to survive and um, um, he said that they there was rock art cave art that represented some of these beings uh, that was 10,000 years old and uh, he directed us to uh, these kinds of uh, drawings that are in, uh, so I've seen people wearing T-shirts with these drawings. Uh, and he said that these beings were the Wangina. They called them the Wangina. And that they were creator beings. That they were, um, all, they had always been a part of human existence. Now, Aboriginal culture goes back at least 40,000 years, okay? These drawings are estimated to be 10,000 years old. But um, the Aborigines uh, say that their culture goes back a, a lot further back than 40,000 years. Uh, but uh, so there's this kind of uh, disagreement between the Aborigines and the um, and the archaeologists. But uh, 40,000 years is a long time for a culture to exist uh, and to survive, uh, and they managed to do it. And they say the shaman says that they managed to do it because of their communication with beings that they met in dream time. And, um, and you know, that, for someone who has never heard that before, um, you just don't know what to do with that, uh, especially someone who comes into UFO research uh, from a very 
uh, like an engineering background, you know? It's, you know, you got to have spaceships that land and, they, and then they get out and talk to you or take you on trips, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, for them, it was all ultra-dimensional, or most of it. Um, so it was after this uh, experience that my book came out, uh, The God Hypothesis, Extraterrestrial Life and Its Implications for Science and Religion. And this is where I tried to walk that straight line between, and very thin line, between science and religion. And to approach the issue of UFOs uh, on a neutral path, taking from science what makes sense, taking from religion and spirituality what makes sense, and not coming at the reader from a religious point of view or from a scientific materialist point of view, but from a, a middle point of view. Because I believe that there is much from science that we have to, to learn that will help us understand the UFO mystery, but if you only use scientific methodology as uh, is used by today's scientific, scientific community, uh, what you find is that there, you're limiting yourself because scientific methodology, as we know it, is a materialistic science and an atheistic science. All right? If you come at this from the religious point of view and you ignore the scientific part, then that limits you also because now you're dealing with uh, fundamentalism. You're dealing with, uh, well, we, the only uh, thing we need to know is what's in this book, whether it's the, the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, whatever. You know, it's, it, it, you're dealing with one, that's a mindset. There's a lot about UFOs in, those, in all of those. Okay? and shamanic experiences. In fact, every religion is based on a shamanic experience of somebody. Jesus was a shaman. He communed regularly with beings from other dimensions. That's shamanic. He learned to heal from somehow from within. He wasn't taught this by other people. That's shamanic, okay? So the religion of Christianity is based on one person's shamanic experience. And the whole rest of Christianity is other people talking about his experience, but not having had their own shamanic experience. So right now, you hear all this talk about the Gnostic Gospels, Okay, and Gnosticism has become well known because of the Da Vinci Code. And, and Gnosticism was a branch of Christianity and of Judaism that dealt with the shamanic aspects of Christianity. And with the idea that each, and each one of us has to have his own shamanic experience. To, to have his own revelation with God. Whereas Orthodox Christianity took the position that, we, no, we, you, you just come to us, the priests and the church, and we'll explain it all to you. Okay? And, and only people of the cloth can have those kinds of experiences. Human, no, regular people, no, you, have to, you can't do that. So Christianity today would be very, very different if Gnosticism had won out over Orthodox Christianity. That's one of the themes of my next book. Um, anyway, um, I think that the thing that, one of the things that John Mack likes so much, uh, and, I so, and I miss him so much, you know that he died of a sudden uh, uh, car Incident where he was run over by a drunk driver in London in, in September 2004. And um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. <clears throat> but I have to tell you that <clears throat> what he liked about my book was that I 
confronted uh, the, the forbidden and taboo subjects of ufology, and I call them the three R's. Um, most ufologists don't want to deal with these three R's. Religion, reincarnation, and reptilians. Okay? <laughs> you get the idea. I'm going to just give you a brief rundown on the conclusions that I came to in writing this book um, and uh, and you let you uh, judge for yourself if you think that that my conclusions match any of your conclusions. Um, one, that we live in an illusory world. That is that we, and I believe this has been proven quite true through quantum physics, that uh, this world that we live in, this 3D or 4D dimensional uh, world that we experience through our limited senses uh, is an illusion. That in fact, uh, when you get down to the quantum level, the, the subatomic level of reality, uh, it, it, do, it, it doesn't behave in any way uh, the way that, that the material reality behaves. And if you, if you were to blow up an atom in, in, to the size of this building, there would be mostly just space. So, you know, we are made up of atoms uh, and, su and subatomic particles, electrons, and these electrons behave in ways that, uh, that nothing else that we know of behaves except the supernatural. We find ESP uh, amongst uh, electrons, and we find the most interesting thing that uh, there is no separation uh, at the subatomic uh, level. Everything is one. There's no, no difference between one electron and another. Uh, and they're all encoded with the same information that would allow them to replicate the whole universe, it seems. This is theory, but uh, this is good quantum theory. Uh, no, so, and this is exactly what mystics have been trying to tell us for so many years, that, that the world is an illusion and that the real uh, world and universe is a non-physical. And uh, that's where we come from and that's where we go. Um, and, but most of us uh, are uh, totally unaware of where we came from, uh, why we came here, what we're supposed to do while we're here, uh, what's going to happen when we leave here, and what we're supposed to do when we get there. So we're really like blind people groping around with these feeble little senses to determine what reality is. And if you think about it, the eyes can see a very limited spectrum of, uh, of light. The ears can hear very, very limited spectrum of sound. Uh, our taste is very uh, help, uh, practically worthless for determining the nature of reality. Uh, touch is pretty, uh, you know, useless also. Um, uh, we really uh, are like ants crawling on the back of an elephant. We have no idea that we're even on an elephant. Uh, we have to use extraordinary uh, other abilities that we have built into, our, uh, into ourselves, into our bodies, to really penetrate this illusion and see what is on the other side. And that's what shamanism is all about, and that's what uh, the UFO abduction um, experience is all about. Um, I have concluded, and I think uh, quantum physicists have concluded also that there are many dimensions, um, uh, multiple dimensions, and uh, that there are higher beings who can traverse these dimensions uh, with their technology. Um, and there's also, also uh, ethereal beings that... Uh, do not uh, need bodies. Um, many such beings exist and have interacted with life on Earth since the beginning of life on Earth. Uh, they uh, may have seeded life on Earth. And uh, among these types of beings, uh, there are a number of different uh, 
uh, apparent races, and some of which are reptilian, and we'll be talking about that for a little bit here. Um, I believe that, they, that beings like this have intervened in the natural evolutionary process many times in the history of the world. There are uh, amazing jumps in evolution that cannot be accounted for by Darwinism. Uh, the human being uh, evolved uh, from its most uh, recent ancestors way, way, way too fast for evolution to account for it. And um, even evolutionists talk, talk about uh, these jumps in evolution and as if that's just, if you put a name on it, that explains it. But actually that doesn't explain it because evolution is supposed to be a slow process. Um, so somebody's been tinkering with, um, uh, with our evolutionary process. Um, Uh, we, uh, these beings have imparted knowledge to humans for millennia and that we are a product of their genetic manipulation. Uh, and so, therefore, I believe that we are hybrids um, that were engineered specifically to be able to perceive the world uh, in this limited fashion. Um, I believe that they are still doing this. Uh, they are still creating hybrid species. I have plenty of, of uh, research, uh, and so do others, uh, that would uh, verify that. Uh, those people having UFO contact experiences uh, are, in fact, experiencing shamanic journeys, whether they know it or not. Uh, I think that in many cases, uh, in abduction cases, people are leaving our reality, they're being taken to another dimension or other realities and then being returned and they return with information and oftentimes the information is shamanic in nature, that is it has to do with healing, it has to do with being stewards of the earth, it has to do with the fact that we're not taking care of the earth and that it's going to have dire consequences and this is something that is rather uniform across the um, the UFO uh, contact experience. Um, I think this has been going on for a long time. Uh, here from the um, Sumerian tablets is a, a being uh, called Enki, uh, who is said in the Sumerian tablets that are at least 5,000 years old uh, to be a a, uh, a godlike being who imparted knowledge to humans and was responsible for engineering uh, the uh, human race. And notice that he's drawn in the form of a reptile. And that is um, very relevant, uh, as we'll see later. Um, you see the the reptile and the double reptile, uh, the intertwined reptiles re represented in, this is an Egyptian culture, um, and represent, the reptile has represented wisdom and particularly uh, healing wisdom. And um, in this very interesting slide uh, has led some people to see it as a representation of the double helix of the DNA molecule, which I'll talk about also. Um, people who have shamanic experiences have and abduction experiences have heightened psychic abilities as a result of their experiences. This is something I have found common wherever I have gone to research. Mexico Australia and all over the United States, uh, same thing. I found that those who confront their experiences and grow with their experiences go through a remarkable transformation from uh, going from one of terror to one of actually uh, learning from their experience, becoming a part of their experience, moving forward with their experience, 
uh, owning uh, their psychic abilities, owning their healing abilities, and oftentimes they move into fields uh, that have to do with the healing arts. Um, I believe that all of this was known to the ancient people and that we are just now rediscovering um, much of this, the, the source of, of life on earth being the DNA molecule and that uh, it even it, that DNA is a very strange thing that, uh, that ha is a great mystery yet. Um, so let's talk about the shaman experience. Humans have had shaman experiences for as long as there have been humans in existence. We have cave art that goes back uh, as much as 32,000, 35,000 years um, that, rep that now, uh, just barely, anthropologists are beginning to recognize that the, this cave art uh, often uh, hidden in deep in, in uh, caves that take a long journey to get to. So it's not like they're doing it as a billboard or anything. Uh, uh, the, the de they depict uh, non-human uh, type of, of figures, anthropomorphic figures. And this, is, this stuff is everywhere, all over the world. This is from Africa, but you can find it in the American Southwest. You can find it wherever you go. Um, and... Uh, so this is one clue that shamanic journeys have been with us as long as there have been humans around. So how do you have a, a shamanic journey? Well, first of all, am I doing something wrong? Okay, well, I uh, hope that, did, there you go, it's still on. Uh, how do you have a shamanic experience? Well, some certain number of people naturally have shamanic experiences. These are people that are just born with a gift. Uh, people like Edgar Cayce, who went into a trance and could uh, his consciousness could leave and go wherever he wanted to go and uh, diagnose uh, people's illnesses and, and uh, prescribe the, the cure. Uh, uh, other people uh, are not so lucky uh, you have to work at it. Uh, there are um, some people who have this experience the hard way through the near-death experience. That's a hard way to become a shaman, to die and then wake up and remember what you were told. And I put people like uh, Daniel Brinkley and, and other people that have had that experience, changed their lives and they turn their lives toward helping others. Um, but then there are those who, um, who work at it and who have for centuries and millennia uh, found methods to get them to these other realities. These are uh, the methods, various methods that are used would be tribal dancing for days upon day upon day until they practically drop over. Uh, uh, chanting, tribal chanting, tribal drumming, uh, fasting. Um, it's usually a difficult road to reach these other realities. Uh, more, uh, t more to the point and easier to achieve uh, is to consume uh, holotropic plants or brews made with holotropic plants. Uh, it's not something I uh, advise people to do. I've never done it myself. But um, uh, interestingly, uh, some scientists uh, are doing that to uh, learn the shamanic experience. And uh, these plants have a certain chemicals that interact with, uh, um, with the brain and allow the, apparently the consciousness of the person to, uh, to leave uh, the body. Uh, this is uh, uh, just to show you uh, an illustration from one of my subjects uh, regarding a, a non-human entity that we would categorize as inse insectoid um, or praying mantis-like. Uh, uh, and I have found in rock art, cave art, uh, uh, representations that look a, a lot like this that are uh, 
hundreds and thousands of years old. Um, these different uh, brews or drugs that are used are called by different names in different cultures. In the Amazon, there is a brew made up of a couple of different plants that is called ayahuasca. That is a name that you will probably be hearing more about. Uh, in some places in the Amazon, it's called yaje. Uh, in Africa, uh, the, the shamans call their brew biwiti. Uh, in other places, ayaboga. Uh, some people just call them magic mushrooms, peyote. Uh, but they all have the uh, same thing in common. They contain in them uh, the chemicals or the, mo the, the molecules that uh, are necessary to achieve this uh, transcendental state where they go into other realities and they commune with beings. Um, now, in late 2003, uh, I called Dr. Mack to talk to him about a book that I had just finished reading that really blew me away. And uh, he was very um, interested in this book because uh, not only did he know about it, but he had actually endorsed that book. Uh, and uh, I was interested to hear, to hear his take on it. Uh, and this was uh, the beginning of uh, what I call the reptilian project that... Uh, John Mack and I and a researcher from California, Barbara Lamb, were working on uh, at the time that John was killed. Uh, the three of us were going to put on a presentation at the conference in uh, Laughlin, Nevada, uh, March of 2005. John was killed September of 2004. So that, uh, uh, through that uh, presentation up in the air. Uh, Barbara and I ended up doing the presentation by ourselves. And um, John was going to talk about uh, the reptilian cases that he had. Uh, the reason being that he felt uh, badly that he had not addressed the issue of reptilians head on. Not many people had, okay? Uh, Linda Howe had, in her book, Glimpses of Other Realities, um, uh, John Carpenter, who was uh, the, the head of, uh, director of alien abductions for MUFON, wrote a couple of columns about uh, reptilians. He had uh, a, des a dozen cases or so in his files. Um, Dr. Carla Turner, the late Dr. Carla Turner, wrote about reptilians, but um, uh, none of the major researchers were saying anything about reptilians. But Hopkins, David Jacobs, mum is the word, okay? And John, John Mack also. Um, and John, and, and for good reasons, for good reasons, uh, reptilians uh, take the UFO abduction discussion to a whole new level. Reptilians bring up the idea of demonic intervention. Reptilians uh, bring up uh, the, story, the issue of the beast. Reptilians uh, bring up uh, sat satanic cults. Reptilians are scary, and people don't want to talk about them because they don't want to deal with all of those issues. And it's hard enough being a scientist and getting science to approve of your research without getting into reptilians, reincarnation, and religion. Okay? So I thought it was amazing that John was telling me over the phone that he felt it was time for him to uh, speak out. And he wanted me to be involved, and he wanted Barbara Lamb to be involved. He was a bit concerned about... Oops. 
Well, I, got, I think I got them mixed up. Okay. That, that's a drawing from one of my subjects of a uh, reptilian. And uh, typically, uh, they're big, strong, macho, uh, aggressive, sexual, um, intelligent, uh, dominating. That, those are words that are used to describe the reptilians that you find in uh, UFO research and, and uh, not uh, the kinds of things that uh, you want to find. In fact, it's probably the worst thing that we could find, you know, truthfully. But uh, what John was afraid of was that because, because of his silence on the issue and the silence of other researchers, that other people had been spreading a lot of information about reptilians that he felt was um, over the top. And this is a, an advertisement I found in a magazine just recently that is advertising Office, Microsoft Office something or other. Got a reptilian in an executive suit. And I'm not going to get into... Uh, that very much other than to say that um, there has been a lot of publicity and a lot of information on the internet and on television about uh, reptilians are in charge of the world and they are they shape shift into uh, into uh, people who are the leaders of our of uh, countries and they are actually pulling all the strings and well we I have to say that I never found that I never found uh, um, John never found that. Barbara Lamb never found that. Uh, so we just have to go by for what we know, and uh, that's what we were going to talk about, rather than, you know, uh, getting negative about what other people might be saying. Um, so Barbara and I uh, had to give that presentation in Laughlin a year ago, March, uh, by ourselves. Without the material that John was going to provide, because he died before we could even see the material, all we had was the outline of what we were going to talk about, and he was going to talk about his case studies uh, and his perceptions, um, some of which I knew the perceptions, but I didn't have access to his case studies, and neither did Barbara, and in fact, all that material went into his estate and got tied up in, in legalities. And um, it was just by chance that uh, somehow, I guess uh, someone's looking after me, I got uh, word that there was one of John's subjects who had had reptilian experiences uh, who wanted to uh, talk to me, and who would be willing to talk to me. So I called her and I uh, talked, she, I asked, I explained what we were doing, and she said, I know, I know that John was working on this project. And John was working a lot of projects all at one time. This wasn't the only thing he was focusing his attention on. Um, uh, so she said, I, I'll talk to you. So I said, well, tell me what your experience was. And she says, well, um, most of my experiences have been with Grays, uh, and this was quite different. She says, uh, it was in the middle of the night. I was taken into a uh, dark cave it, it was moist and uh, it was not like the sanitary uh, places that the greys take you it was dirt on the floor I was strapped into a reclining chair and I was sexually assaulted by a reptilian uh, and the next morning I woke up with um, three needle marks uh, on my abdomen in a triangular shape. I called John Mack immediately because she had been working with John and I told him what happened, what I recalled. Uh, he had a session with her uh, in which she was able to remember more of it, of the details. And as she's telling me this story, I'm thinking, you know, I've heard this story so many times. Um, I've had cases exactly like this, where uh, reptilians take 
uh, woman, a woman into a, a cave uh, and have uh, sexual intercourse. And um, uh, this isn't the first time I'd heard that story. Of course, she didn't know anybody else that had had such uh, a, a thing happen to her. And uh, she, when she told John the story, um, John's reaction was, well, it sounds like this happened in another reality. And, you know, reptile, the, the reptile, I mean, that could be like an archetype. And so he was an intellectual and a psychiatrist, and he had, he had a tendency to think in those ways as his first reaction. And her response was, John, I was raped by a reptilian. And for me, it was real. And here's the marks. And he says, okay, uh, I'm sorry. Because he, John treated his subjects like co-researchers. And that's why they liked him so much. He honored their perceptions. But when he wrote about it, he, he had to write like a scientist, which he was. So, you know, finally, um, he agreed that, yeah, well, okay, you're right. It, for you, this was very real. And a lot of the discussion that I had with him uh, about all of this was, you know, what is real and what is not real? How much of alien abduction stories happen in our reality and how much happen in another dimension or reality? Because a lot of this does seem like uh, there's some other reality to it. Uh, had cases where uh, people actually saw a dimensional doorway open, you know, in their room at night, and out came uh, beings that then took them into this dimensional portal and took them someplace else. Uh, a lot of this seems other dimensional. And the question is if it's other dimensional, if this happens in another dimension, then can we call it real? And John and I both agreed that uh, we didn't think it made a difference, that if it happens in our dimension or somebody else's dimension, uh, it, it's still real, especially for the person who experienced it. And um, however, you know, legally speaking, uh, it'd be hard to prosecute somebody that did something wrong in another dimension. Okay, so we got some ways to go before we can accept all of that. Um, so um, the book that John and I were interested in was a book that was written by a medical doctor. Nope, that's another reptilian. Just, just, just to show you that there's a lot of variations here. This guy right here, Dr. Richard Strassman, he's a medical doctor who uh, lives in Taos, New Mexico, but from uh, 1990 to 1995, he conducted a five-year research study at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque uh, under the, uh, get this, under the auspices of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, and with funding from the National Institute of Drug Abuse and the U.S. Nas National Institute of Health. This guy got heavy-duty support for doing a study on a hallucinogenic drug on volunteers, more than 700 volunteers. And this is the first study on a hallucinogenic drug that was permitted by the U.S. government since the 1960s when all of that was ruled illegal. How he got permission to do this, I don't know. Uh, and probably we wouldn't even be aware that the study took place but for the fact that he wrote a book. And this is the book. I recommend it to you if you haven't seen it yet. It's called DMT, the spirit molecule. And DMT stands for a molecule called NN-dimethyltryptamine. Okay? This little molecule 
turns out, is extraordinarily powerful in causing a hallucinogenic altered state in which the people who take it claim that they left their, their consciousness, left their body, and went someplace else and communicated with beings. So, for five years, he administered to more than 700 volunteers, injecting pure DMT uh, into their veins or into their bodies. And this DMT then works its way up into the brain and affects a little gland in the middle of the brain called the pineal gland. Okay? Now, this little organ located in the center of the brain is not even made out of brain tissue. In fact, in the embryo, it develops low in the body and only at the end, in the end stages of development, does it rise up and lodge itself in the middle of the brain. This little gland uh, has been called the seat of the soul by mystics for a long time, going all the way back to Descartes. Um, and let's see if I have a slide of the pineal gland. If you can see that, uh, the I don't have a pointer, but I, I think you can see it. It's uh, it, on the right-hand side from the bottom up, the third uh, line says pineal gland, and then it has an arrow pointing toward the direct center of the brain. So it's very well protected in, within the brain. And in fact, in primitive uh, species, it is the pineal gland that actually serves as the eye. So it has been called the third eye. It is the way that we see when we are dreaming, when we close our eyes and we can envision something, when we're under hypnosis and have our eyes closed, we're seeing, we can have visions of things, and it happens through the use of the pineal gland. Now, interestingly, the pineal gland uh, manufactures its own DMT. It is a natural occurring molecule in our body and in animals and plants. But normally in very small quantities. But when the pineal gland is stimulated by a large dose of DMT, amazing things happen. So doctor, and it's also the main ingredient, DMT is the main molecule in ayahuasca and other hallucinogenic brews that shamans use. Okay? So Dr. Strassman set out to test his hypothesis that excessive production of DMT by the pineal gland might account for experiences that are reported by those persons having near-death experiences and other mystical experiences. Um, the stunning aspect of his findings uh, is that more than half of his subjects reported being transported to other high-tech dimensions and meeting with beings who communicated telepathically to them. And these beings were more common than not insectoids and reptilians they did not believe that they were having hallucinations. They believed that they were actually transported to other dimensions. Uh, in some cases, they found themselves lying on operating tables and having these beings perform operations, surgeries, and, and putting implants into their ethereal bodies. Very interesting. The communication was always telepathic. And Dr. Strassman says, you know, you can imagine, he, here's this doctor and he's sitting there with his lab coat and his, uh, and his clipboard injecting this stuff into people and trying to uh, objectively observe what, what they're going through and then talking to them about it afterwards, you know. 
And um, he says, um, only later, when the study was well underway, did I also begin considering DMT's role in the alien abduction phenomenon. And that's when he went running to John Mack for help because the similarities were, were eerie. And uh, Strassman had the, uh, the courage to conclude that uh, he didn't think that his subjects were hallucinating. He did believe that they were, in fact, uh, going to other dimensions and communing with uh, intelligent entities. A lot of the information that they were given uh, was not information that, uh, that the individuals had uh, and, and in a way proved that they had actually been someplace and talked to somebody that had great knowledge. Um, John and I speculated, although Strassman was, because he did not really know that much about the abduction experience and all the physical evidence that goes along with it uh, and all of the, the physical evidence of UFOs, uh, Strassman was more inclined to think, well, you know, this accounts for alien abductions. Uh, it's merely uh, the pineal gland that's uh, it, it suddenly, uh, for some reason, uh, creating a lot of DMT. John and I, when we talked, we had another theory. What if those implants that are being put up people's noses and implanted in the brain and take, they take your eye out, they put an implant in your brain? We know this has been going on for a long time, and that's been a mystery. What if those implants allow the beings to remotely stimulate the pineal gland to create a large dosage of DMT so that the person leaves his body and comes to them. That could be a part of this mystery that we're studying that we have not known about before. So that got me very excited. And then I found um, this very interesting excerpt this comes from a woman writing in 1925. She was a well-known spiritualist and uh, metaphysicist by the name of Alice Bailey. Maybe some of you are familiar with Alice Bailey's work. Well, I got a copy of Alice Bailey's, one of Alice Bailey's books called... Um, Cosmic Fire, and it's dense, okay? For someone that's not really tra trained in, in the metaphysical jargon of that time, uh, it takes a, a long time to go through it. But there was a reward. On page 892, <laughs> going on to page 893, I found the following uh, passage, which I want to share with you. This is what she says. Um, I'll give you another slide to look at. So that, there's the, the third eye, the magic third eye, okay? And um, here is a drawing of, uh, from an Egyptian temple of the pharaoh, and it looks like the pharaoh and his wife uh, like in some kind of a trance because they're, they're bit leaning over like they're floating or something and they are receiving wisdom from serpents whose tails are crossed which has uh, a special meaning for me because I find uh, many, many cases of the entwined serpent uh, in the history of the world. Uh, even the American Medical Association uses that symbol uh, of, a, of entwined serpents uh, on a, uh, climbing the tree of knowledge as the caduceus, as the representation of medicine and modern medicine. Um, but anyway, listen to what she says about all of this. 1925, Alice Bailey in her book Cosmic Fire says, 
The secret of the reptile kingdom is one of the mysteries of the second round of initiation into the occult. This isn't for beginners in the occult. You know, if you're going to really rise in the levels of, of spiritual maturity, you, you, you take it step at a time. And, and the, the mystery of the reptile kingdom is something that you learn in the second round of initiation. I don't know how many rounds. I forget how many rounds there are. but And there is a profound significance connected with the expression the serpents of wisdom, which is applied to all adepts of the good law. Good law, okay? So if you are an adept of the good law, then you could be considered a wisdom of serpent, a serpent of wisdom. Now, the reptile kingdom, she says, has an interesting place in all mythologies and all ancient forms of truth impartation. It's interesting to know. Um, And this for no arbitrary reason. There is an underlying truth which is hidden in the karmic history of our planetary logos. So you, have, you really have to understand the metaphysical side of the universe, the non-physical, to understand this kind of stuff. She says, this is the basis for that activity we called evolution energy. The heavenly serpent manifested, being produced out of the egg and began its convolutions, gaining strength and majesty and producing through its immense fecundity, millions of lesser serpents. The reptile kingdom is the most important part of the animal kingdom for all animal life can be seen passing through it during the prenatal stage. That is, you and I have a reptilian aspect to us. It is deep within our brain and it is called the reptilian core. It is the part Uh, that provides us with the uh, automatic instincts of survival uh, and um, the very basis of of our instincts. Um, The connection is not purely a physical one, but it is also a psychic one. The secret of life lies hidden in the serpent stage. Not the life of the spirit, but the life of the soul. And this will be revealed as the serpent of the astral light is duly studied. So they have to study the the serpent of the astral light in order to uh, graduate from this mystery school. Um, Do you another slide to look at? That's kind of the back view of the head with the, the third eye. Um, It has to do with the subject of the third eye and its relation to the spine. This third eye is one of the objects of kundalinic vivification. The first center is at the base of the spine, the home of the sleeping fire. At the summit of the spinal column and surmounting all that small organ called the pineal gland, which when vivified causes the third eye to open and the beauties of the higher, subtler planes to stand revealed. Wow. You read this, written in 1925. You read Dr. Strassman's book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and they just go just hand in hand. The opening of the third eye is the way that shamans and and psychics are able to transverse our reality and see through the illusion of the physical reality. I thought that was neat. (laughs) See how much time I have. Okay. Um, Another book that I would recommend for you is this one, The Cosmic Serpent. 
I think this is an absolute must-read book for everyone in this field. I will tell you just briefly, this is a, a book called, uh, with a subtitle, DNA and the Origins of Knowledge, uh, written by Jeremy Narby, N-A-R-B-Y, Ph.D., who is a, a Stanford University uh, educated uh, anthropologist. And he, as a young 25-year-old graduate student, went down to the Amazon uh, to do a dissertation on how the native peoples learn the different uses of plants. And he started talking to the experts, who are the shamans. And, and the first one he talked to said, well, I'll tell you how we know. Uh, we drink ayahuasca and we meet with other beings uh, and they tell us how to use these plants. And he looked at the guy's face and he says he wasn't smiling. He was serious. But as a 25-year-old graduate student of anthropology, he was not prepared to accept that. And so he kept asking other people. And he kept getting the same answer. And so finally, even though he knew he shouldn't, he says, well, there's only one way to find out. And he took some ayahuasca. He participated with a shaman and took some ayahuasca. All right? Well, that was an experience for um, Professor Narby soon to be Professor Narby. Uh, he says, I found, when he took this brew, I found myself surrounded by two giant boa. Thing. If you can see the, the serpents like, like dancing together there in the upper left-hand corner. This is a representation of a shamanic uh, vision and a, a shamanic journey uh, by a sh uh, Peruvian shaman named pa Pablo Amaringo. And uh, if you get uh, the book that has these uh, drawings, they're beautiful. It's called Ayahuasca Visions. Uh, well, this is what Jer Jeremy Narby saw. He says, I found myself surrounded by two gigantic boa constrictors that seemed 50 feet long. I was terrified. Then the snakes started talking to me telepathically. They explained to me that I am just a human. I feel my mind crack. And in the fissures, I see the bottomless arrogance of my presuppositions. It is profoundly true that I am just a human being. And most of the time, I have the impression of understanding everything, whereas here, I find myself in a more powerful reality that I do not understand at all, and that in my arrogance, I did not even suspect existed. It seemed as if my last link to reality had been severed. Reality itself seemed to be no more than a distant one-dimensional memory. And though, and the thought entered my head, the boa constrictors were, were saying this to him. Poor little human being who has lost his language and feels sorry for himself. He says, I never felt so completely humble. So he became a believer in the shamanic way and in other realities and wrote a wonderful book about this, uh, which I could go on for an hour. Here are some other drawings from uh, the Peruvian shama shaman's work. This is a healing ceremony. Uh, and it's hard to see in this picture, but... Uh, 
there are all kinds of beings. This guy's doing a healing on a, on a psychic healing on somebody, but there's all these other beings over here on the side. There's these like kings and there's these angelic beings. And then if you see up in the behind the the in the in the air, you can barely see there are some uh, flying saucers. Okay, and uh, that's the flying saucers uh, close up of the flying saucers. So many many shamans. Uh, who experience ayahuasca or other brews uh, say that in these other dimensions when they travel that they meet extraterrestrials. And so UFOs are a big part of the shamanic experience. So here we go, you know, we're going around around full circle. Um, This is another drawing of a of a giant mantis kind of creature that is seen uh, in a, in, it was seen in a, one of these shamanic journeys. But if you look up in the right-hand corner, you will see UFOs. And I think I have a close-up of that. Okay? Up in the corners, off to the edges, there's UFOs. And these beings from the UFOs are there to help with the healing. Now, this happens to be the vine that they use to draw the ayahuasca that has the DMT molecule. Does it remind you of anything? The, the, the intertwined serpents, the DNA molecule. And this is what led Jeremy Narby to conclude that uh, what is actually happening is that uh, people who the shamans are actually communicating with the consciousness of uh, the DNA molecule. That DNA molecule has consciousness. DNA is an extraordinary mystery. It is so complex that we can barely understand it. Uh, it is uh, a. It has been called a a code, a text. Uh, uh, Parts of the the DNA molecule have been called uh, robots uh, and uh, self-replicating robots. Uh, It is uh, extraordinarily sophisticated and complex. It operates on uh, two different languages. The DNA language, which has four letters, A, C, G, and T, and uh, then the, the language of the, uh, of the um, amino acids, no, the, the proteins, I'm sorry, uh, and there are 20 letters in that language. And the only way that DNA can create life, and of course the same DNA molecule is in every living thing, in every, the cell of every living thing on Earth, it just depends. It, it, the difference is how much code there is in, in that particular uh, life form to create a human or a toad or a oak, oak or whatever. And they can't do anything, DNA can't do anything without deciphering, having in, uh, translating the codes from the 20 letters uh, alphabet over here and the four letter alphabet over here. So uh, somehow uh, a translator got put in place. And the translator is the, it, our enzymes. And without the enzymes, it wouldn't work at all because the two languages can't communicate with with each other. So we have two sets of languages. We have the translator mechanism, and that is how uh, this DNA is able to work. Problem with DNA is that when Francis Crick, uh, who was the co-discoverer of the double helix shape of the of the DNA molecule, when he uh, studied the history of DNA he realized that uh, there was a big problem, that DNA had never changed in the 3.8 billion years that DNA has been on this planet because there are fossil back, fossilized bacteria that are exactly like today's bacteria that are 3.8 billion years old. Uh, there is no difference between those bacteria. There has never been any other uh, forms of bacteria of uh, DNA found, uh, and it uh, simply, DNA just simply appeared here about 3.8 billion years ago. So Francis Crick concluded uh, that um, 
that this either was done by what did what happened by chance, as we're told by science, or it didn't. So he ran very sophisticated computer models to try to determine the odds of such a complex organism uh, becoming uh, uh, putting get, being put together by accident say by a lightning bolt or by just chemical reactions. And he discovered that the odds of that happening were, were greater than uh, the number of all the atoms in the universe. So he concluded wisely that you could, we could rule out DNA as being an accidental thing. So then uh, the question is, okay, where did it come from? If it didn't uh, evolve here, and if it didn't wasn't created by accident, where did it come from? And he created the theory of di directed panspermia, which merely says that DNA was sent here by higher intelligence long, long time ago, and that life on Earth was seeded uh, from uh, other life forms elsewhere in the universe. Now, uh, since that time, uh, by the way, it's also known that uh, while he was trying to understand the, the, the form, form uh, the DNA took, uh, he took uh, LSD to open his mind to, uh, the, to understand such things. So um, he was also exploring in shamanic ways. But... Uh, so we have now NASA, who has twice announced that uh, DNA comes from outer space. The first time was with the Mars meteorite, where they found um, nanobacteria, fossilized nanobacteria. That was pretty much poo-pooed by the scientific community. And then um, in August of 2004, uh, they found another meteor, uh, that uh, they said this one was from Europe, the other one was from the, I think, the Antarctic. And they found uh, the same thing, but much more convincing uh, fossilized bacteria and made another big press conference saying that uh, they found fossilized bacteria on another meteor, but this one they don't know where it came from. Uh, God knows it could have been flying through space for a billion years. So we do know that DNA exists, and the, the bacteria that they found uh, is exactly the, like the bacteria that you find here on Earth, uh, with the ex exception that it has uh, different uh, isotopic readings that you do not find on Earth. So definitely alien DNA. NASA is telling this. Dr. Francis Crick, Nobel laureate, told us this in his book, Life Itself, you know, I think it's about time that we recognize that um, where or our origins are from, and they're not from here, uh, we're all from out there someplace. And if DNA exists elsewhere, then uh, there is definitely some form of life out there waiting for us to be, to, for us to discover, except that I think they discovered us first. I'm all, totally out of time. I could talk for two more hours on the subject. Thank you for your kind attention. I love you all. God bless you.